Thank you for joining us. Uh, the Colombian is pleased to welcome Bill McSherry, Boeing Vice President of Government Operations, right. and Kelly Maloney with the Aerospace Futures Alliance. Correct. Is that correct? Yes. Um, I'm Greg Jane, the editorial uh, page editor. And just so you know, uh, we are videotaping this. We'll post it on our website unedited okay. for the benefit of our readers. Just because I think they would also like an update on what <coughs> Boeing and the industry is doing in the state. And so we'll start with that. What brings you to town? So we, um, uh, you know, we've been getting out and telling our story a little bit around the state. Uh, we were here uh, for a breakfast meeting with uh, some of the business community uh, this morning in a, in a dinner meeting last night. And uh, while we were down here, we thought we would come by and uh, just right. visit with you. Thank you. Yeah. So what is the latest? What, what are you telling of your story? So a couple of things. First of all, you know, we celebrated our centennial mm -hmm. this year. So 100 years ago in uh, July, Boeing was founded here uh, in the state of Washington. And, you know, while we have become a global company with 150-ish thousand people uh, worldwide, you know, about half of the company's workforce continues to be here in Washington with about 75,000 uh, folks. And so um, when you look at Boeing and sort of compare that to other companies, um, we're the largest employer here in Washington. Um, we have a higher percentage of our folks here in Washington really than, than any other major company. I think Microsoft is probably the next with uh, 40,000, uh, which is about a quarter of their workforce. And here we are with almost double that and, and then uh, and then uh, about half of our workforce uh, being here. Uh, and so, you know, it's always, uh, in our opinion, a good idea to get out and update folks on where the company is, where we see the industry going, uh, what some of the challenges and opportunities are uh, ahead of us, and how they relate back to the state. Well, let's talk about where, and especially for the industry, sure. where is it going? And what does that mean for the state of Washington? That's a good question. I think the industry overall is really looking at innovation for um, its path forward. So there's a lot of um, new technology that's out there, additive manufacturing um, and uh, composites. They're also looking at, um, there's a lot of uh, new tooling, kind of um, automated tooling. And so the workforce development initiatives around megatronics, which is both creating and fixing the tooling, that type of stuff. And so we're, we're looking at a lot of growth potential across the industry in the state of Washington. And that's driven by the, you know, the long-term market. Uh, every year we do a look, a 20-year look ahead at the, at the commercial market. Uh, we released the numbers in June, and, the, and, and what we just released was uh, over the next 20 years, uh, uh, airlines are going to buy 39,000 commercial airplanes around the world, almost 40,000, uh, with a market value of $5.9 trillion. Uh, and of course, like any industry, you know, um, they want more capability uh, um, and, and lower cost. So a lot of what Kelly's describing is how do we, you know, push the innovation envelope not only in uh, the performance of the airplane but also in how we build them so that we can continue to deliver you know a better and better airplane at more and more affordable prices uh, for our customers because all of us as consumers that's what we're demanding of the airlines right is we, we don't we choose to fly for the lowest fare often most most often uh, and so then uh, what they they try to get better for less and then they and then they ask us as um, as their suppliers uh, to get better for less in terms of uh, the uh, affordable yeah. uh, options, uh, a few years ago, Boeing moved some of its operations to uh, South Carolina. There was uh, uh, some uh, intense reaction to that from the state of Washington. How has the uh, South Carolina moved work uh, so far, and do you anticipate uh, any other uh, moves of that nature? So South Carolina was not a move. South Carolina was a new facility that we opened. Uh, there was no, you know, we didn't move, uh, you know, we have two production lines now at the 787, uh, one here and, and, and one in South Carolina. Um, so the South Carolina <coughs> facility is performing really well. Um, you know, South Carolina and Everett um, are jointly producing uh, 787s. I think there's, you get a lot of benefit from having two uh, facilities. 
Um, certainly, however, if you say where are the new airplanes going, right? So the 737 MAX, uh, which we're uh, developing right now, and we've started to build the initial ones, are uh, all going to be built in Renton. Uh, the 777X is the latest airplane uh, that we um, uh, decided to build. We agreed, of course, that we would build that in Everett after a lot of negotiations with the state and, and the union. And the, and the thing that I think a lot of times people don't know, especially on the 777X, we agreed to build, uh, perform final assembly here, fuselage assembly, wing assembly here uh, for the 777X. And we agreed uh, to the highest level of accountability with the state of Washington uh, of any company ever when we, when we um, uh, said, we will build the wing and the fuselage and we'll perform final assembly here for every 777X in its derivative forever. Uh, and if ever we build, if ever we perform wing assembly or final assembly somewhere else, uh, we lose the 777X incentive. So, uh, you know, our two latest, newest airplanes are going to be built uh, right here, 100% here in Washington State. Right. And, I, and I might have uh, uh, misstated uh, the word move, but obviously there was a decision. Sure, made right. By Boeing a location say, decision, hey, yes. I could, I could put this new assembly plant uh, where we choose to put right. that assembly plant, and you chose South Carolina. Some people might have felt like maybe you should chosen the state sure. of Washington. And I'm assuming that was done in part uh, because of labor cost savings. And so the real question for there is relative to the labor cost savings, savings that's a right to work state, the, this isn't. And so I'm really trying to get at how important those things are uh, to Boeing. Um. You know, I wouldn't. I. I. You keep, I don't want to speculate about the future airplanes. Okay, so um, I would say, uh, you know, here in Washington, we have a unionized workforce, right. and we work with the union. Uh, in South Carolina, uh, we don't have a unionized workforce, and we think that it should stay that way. Uh, we think the direct uh, relationship with our employees in South Carolina is better for us and better for our employees. You know. Um, I, I don't want to get into you know sort of hypotheticals down the way because I don't I don't know what's going to happen. I know that uh, since then uh, we've worked with um, both the community and the union to locate the max here, uh, yeah. and then we worked with the community and with the unions uh, to locate the triple seven X here, uh, and those programs are both going really well. And one other move issue: um, how has the uh, uh, move uh, of the headquarters uh, to my hometown uh, <laughs> of uh, Chicago uh, worked and was in the, has that worked out uh, well for you guys? Um, well, you know, so how do you want to measure that? So if you go back to 2001, uh, you know, 9-11 happened and, and uh, all the tragic and uh, attacks of, of, of that day and the industry went into a downturn. Uh, forgive me for not remembering exactly when the headquarters moved. I think it was in 2001 or two or so, um, right around there. Um, my point is, um, you got down to the uh, the lowest point of Boeing's employment was in 2003, when we had about 53,000 people in the state, and it was about a third of the workforce. Uh, and since 2003. Uh, up through 2012 where we peaked and we can talk about that and today um, with the headquarters uh, in Chicago and even by bringing South Carolina on we've gone from 53,000 people in the state of Washington and a third of our workforce to today 75,000 and change in the state of Washington and almost half of our workforce so I think sometimes the perception is you know a lot of these sort of moves and other things and the reality is you know, we have grown by a significant factor in the state in that period of time. Uh, and we also grown uh, uh, or concentrated our, our workforce in the, in the state of Washington d during that period of time, even with bringing South Carolina on uh, and other things. Uh, and while um, certainly we've always got improvements to make um, and efficiencies to achieve and all that kind of stuff, um, you know, s right now, uh, Things are going pretty well. We're we're producing a lot more airplanes. 
uh, today than we were uh, back then. Well, was that big city presence uh, uh, for Boeing's headquarters important for the overall company perspective? I'm trying to get a feel for yeah. uh, sort of the importance of that kind of a move. Yeah, you know, uh, I was not of the company at the time, so I only know what I can remember from uh, reading things. And, uh, you know, this, the stated purpose was to remove the corporate headquarters from either of the two operating units, right? The BDS, Boeing Defense and Space, which is in St. Louis, or BCA, Boeing Commercial uh, Airplanes, which is in Seattle. Uh, you know, and, and, and so that's why uh, Chicago is, was, was picked. Okay, good. Great city. Yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. <laughs> from here, yeah. No, and actually, I want to follow up on that a little. For, to build the triple CMAX here. Yeah. Went through long negotiations, and yep. uh, the legislature had a special session, and yep. finally extended tax breaks yep. for the company. Um, and then almost immediately, Boeing moved some other jobs right. elsewhere, right. not related to the triple seven. Correct. Um, it, can you understand why maybe taxpayers were a little miffed at that? Uh, our CEO for commercial, Ray Connor, has said it was it was not handled best and that and the timing was was not the best uh so yes we can understand why why you know the uh, folks uh would be upset with that i will say um uh despite that that you know we have invested uh hundreds of millions well over a billion dollars in making good on the commitment that we made which was to build the triple seven x here uh and every triple seven x forever here um, we brought back to Washington wing manufacturing, wing uh, assembly. Uh, we're building the largest, most technologically advanced wing ever conceived. Uh, we just spent well over a billion dollars to build the factory for it in Everett. The factory is uh, 1.4 million square feet. It can hold 24 NFL football fields. Uh, it's going to have, uh, you know, the latest technology and how you uh, build uh, these uh, these wings, and we're pushing the technological envelope uh, in Everett because of that decision. And where were uh, wings assembled prior to that? Well, you know, uh, we've often built the wings. Of course, the, the 787 wing is uh, built in Japan uh, by one of our partners, uh, and then brought and then brought to Everett. But for the 777X, mm -hmm. we made the decision to build it uh, in Everett. Yeah, and it, deciding where to site a plant or a production line. How important is it to have a properly educated workforce? And do you guys work with the state to try and meet your needs? Yeah. Uh, workforce is essential. Uh, lots of things go into competitiveness. I mean, cost of doing business is really important. The ability to get permits is really important. Uh, predictability in your political environment and the uh, ability the, of, of uh, the state to uh, be consistent in its approach to the industry is really important. Workforce is one of the most important things. Uh, it's a particular challenge for us right now, by the way, because we've got a lot of folks getting ready to retire. When you think about our machinists and you think about our engineers, um, tens of thousands of people, about half of them are going to be eligible to retire here in the next three, four, five years. Uh, and we're really concerned uh, that if they all retire at the same time uh, or within sh quick succession, w we couldn't find uh, the people uh, to replace them here uh, in the state. So we've been doing a ton of work with the state um, and with school districts in lots of areas to make sure that we're getting kids the, uh, and students the education they need to be able to seize the opportunities that we know are going to come open in our industry but also in other tech industries and also other manufacturing industries where they have the same issue with workforce getting ready to retire, maritime, uh, some utility uh, industries, uh, aviation, you know, airlines and that kind of thing. Uh, we all have a very similar challenge on our hands, which is, you know, on one level a serious challenge. On one level it's a great opportunity for uh, the next generation of folks that are in school right now and uh, will be our uh, workforce uh, for the next 30 and 40 years. You know, of all those factors that you mentioned, where is Washington doing the worst? What's the weakness as far as? Um, Washington is not a low cost state. Uh, and I think for a lot of production. For, well, probably for, for any industry, for, certainly for labor. 
um, but also for cost of doing business in general. Um, if you look at how Washington stacks up against competitor states, uh, even with the aerospace tax incentives, we are not a low-cost state. The aerospace tax incentives put Washington in the game from a cost perspective, but they do not make Washington a low-cost state. Um, now, there's a lot, I mean, what, labor costs are high here. Labor, labor is worth it here, right? I mean, they, so, um, but we are not, um, we are not a low-cost state. Uh, so you need to find ways to make that up in other areas. And of course, you know, productivity are, we have very productive uh, factories. Uh, the Boeing team in Washington is highly productive. Um, and we have a really well-educated workforce. And of course, that's why we, uh, you know, have thrived with design and other things here for a long, long time. Uh, but the biggest challenge is sort of cost and predictability and, and, and that kind of thing in, in Washington. I don't know. That's our perspective. I don't know, Kelly, if the rest of the industry would, would say the same thing or, or not. I would think so. Um, you mentioned the tax incentives and how they don't really even uh, compare with other um, incentives you're getting from, we're, the industry is getting from other states. And I know that I hear uh, a lot from um, uh, those in the industry that they're being uh, basically um, called, emailed uh, daily or weekly from other states trying to get them to move to um, another state. And the incentives are significant that they're being, um, a, you know, that they're trying to be attracted with. So. Um, I think that all whatever we can do as a state to maintain and help grow the, the industry overall. We have more than 1,400 aerospace companies in the state, aerospace related companies, and it's essential um, to keep them here and keep them strong. But this, this really ultimately becomes the, the crux of the issue. Uh, and, and certainly you've heard both sides of the argument, as I'm sure you have too, which is on the one hand, you have this. Uh, call it a highly skilled, uh, highly educated uh, workforce and uh, uh, heavily unionized uh, in these particular areas that uh, we're talking about. And what is said on that side uh, is, yeah, you get this highly educated, highly skilled workforce. On the other end, you've got all of these incentives. But when a company looks at these two competing arguments, mm -hmm. uh, not enough incentives up here, more incentives somewhere, let's say, in Texas uh, versus this highly skilled workforce. When a company has to look at those two competing factors, uh, does, a, is, does a company oftentimes say, hey, look, we'll take the better incentives and train that workforce versus we're going to take the worst incentives knowing that we already have a workforce that's mm -hmm. skilled? That becomes the issue. Mm -hmm. How does how is that playing out today? Is there a lean? I mean, we know places like Texas uh, are growing pretty rapidly in terms mm -hmm. of businesses mm -hmm. moving into areas mm -hmm. like that. Are, is Washington State losing that battle? Hmm. You know, uh, I'm not sure I'm fully qualified to answer that question. Um, I, I, the one thing I'd say is I don't know if there is a prototypical company. I think everybody's different, right? I think everyone has a different uh, situation, and they all make decisions uh, for different reasons. Um, and I don't know if it's sort of, you know, the on one hand this, on the, on the other hand that, I think it all comes down to uh, a value statement. And it's going to be different, I, I think, you know, for every company. Uh, Kelly can probably talk about that. You know, um, so I don't know if I can, you know, you probably want to economic developer or somebody like that who's really working with companies on a day-in and day-out basis to answer that question. But aren't the stats saying that the Texases of this country are winning? Um, I think it depends on what you're uh, looking at. How about uh, companies I would, moving to states? I would tell you that wa the state of Washington in 2003 made a decision to compete by enacting the aerospace tax incentives. And through a couple of different things over the years, uh, extended them, you know, to uh, to other parts of the industry, and then in 2013, chose to extend them to to win the triple seven X. And I would say those were excellent decisions. 
And the, and the, the result of that, and I can only speak for our company, is that in 2003, <coughs> 53,000 people worked at Boeing in the state of Washington, and it was a third of our workforce, and today 75,000 people work at Boeing in the state of Washington, and it's half. So that sounds like a really good decision that they made to me that has paid off really well for the state. Uh, we've grown here. You know, we've, uh, we've had uh, a lot of success here. Um, there are probably other opinions on, on, you know, sort of other, you know, companies and certainly every state, or not every state, certainly a lot of states are, are seeing their uh, manufacturing industries grow. Uh, for us, uh, it's a, uh, it's, it's been um, not an either or, however, on, on this notion of, you know, here or there. Well, Kelly, do you have another opinion? Well, no, I, I agree. It's going to be um, company specific and what they what they value or what's easier or better for them. Um, I know that uh, there was an independent study that just came out last week, in fact, um, by Community Attributes that showed that um, the industry has grown by about 4,000 workers over the last year, from 14 to 15. And so there's there's we continue to have growth, um, but we know that there are companies that do look at other states. Um, but they're trying to, um, you know, I, I think the majority of companies in Washington State are trying to say, I've got my core book of business here. I want to continue to, continue to, to do my business here, even if uh, they've got um, uh, work statements from outside of the state. Um, but they, they want to try and, the majority of them, my understanding is they want to try and stay here if they can as a location. Um, they may have a small, um, you know, maybe uh, branches or whatever you want to call them that are in other states. But the growth, I think, for the most part, uh, continues to be here. Um, and I think that, you know, you hit on something earlier about workforce development and some of the other issues. And I know the industry really has coalesced around that issue and is trying to um, continue to grow the workforce here in the state. I think that's a really important piece of it. So, so you don't think that the state has to do more to keep guys no, like no, that's not what I'm around. saying. <laughs> no, I absolutely think that there's a lot of work to be done. Um, uh, I think we need to make sure we remain competitive. Yes. I think that um, the worst thing we could do is harm what we've already done or go back on deals we've already made. I think that that would send a terrible message to anyone who wants to locate here. Uh, if, um, if the state will change the terms of any deal it makes after you've sunk uh, your costs into the ground, uh, I, 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 I worry about the ability of the state to compete for future work. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need to remain uh, committed to finding ways to be cost competitive. Washington, as I said earlier, is not a low-cost state. It does have a lot of other, you know, uh, really competitive uh, attributes. And if I had to boil it down, I would say keep the incentive structure as it is. Don't do no harm to the incentive structure because certainty is really important. And then let's go focus on this workforce uh, opportunity that we have for Washington students because we're talking about thousands of jobs, not only in our industry but in others, that are going to come open uh, that right now we've got to find a way to get kids educated to fill them. Mm -hmm. uh, and that to me is the really big opportunity we should be focused on uh, over the next few years. If, if the state hadn't made that relatively large move with Boeing for incentives, would you guys still be here? I have no idea. I, I mean, I don't even know if I can answer that question. I know, I know that we have grown because uh, I know that the that the employment has grown for because the state competed for and won the seven eight seven, and that brought thousands of jobs uh, along with the recovery and other things. Thousands of jobs to the state over the last twelve years. The state competed and won on the triple seven X, and that has solidified, you know the future uh, for that program. Um, we need to continue to be competitive. Uh, and we need to make sure that we're, you know, as competitive relative to other states as possible uh, while we focus on this workforce opportunity that we have in front of us. So in the past couple of days, there have been stories about 
uh, Boeing making inroads in Qatar and China. Uh, has the export import bank played a role in that, and how important is that to your international? The export import bank is essential uh, for uh, us to compete uh, because against it's our competitors. A football. It has it, in yeah. the last few years. It has. You know, it, it wasn't always. Uh, for many years, it was. Uh, it was a you know bipartisan agreement, uh, unanimous consent type of thing. Um, in recent years, it's become uh, very politicized. The fact of the matter is, our competitors in Europe have at least two or three um, such entities that they can use to help uh, with, their, uh, with their export finance. Certainly, other competitors in other countries have uh, you know, banks that they can use. Um, it puts you at a competitive disadvantage for export. Um, the Export Import Bank makes money for the U.S. Treasury by uh, encouraging companies to export overseas. Certainly, we use the Export uh, Bank, but the or Export Import Bank, but the vast majority of the transactions it, it is involved with are for small businesses that export. Uh, and uh, we are very worried because without the ability for the Export Import Bank to function, uh, you that we could start to see a dramatic slip in our in our our ability as an industry to export, uh, as well as the ability of smaller companies to export. Um, I forget. Uh, I shouldn't say that. You know. 15 years ago, we were probably 80 percent, 75, 80 percent um, uh, concentrated in the domestic market as far as our, our, our sales. It's a mirror image now. We are uh, heavily uh, exporting. Um, we just learned that in 2015, the aerospace industry accounted for 60 percent of Washington State's exports. Um, we are, you know, Washington is with, if not the only, one of the few states that has a trade surplus, mostly because of uh, of our industry. Uh, Boeing is the largest exporter in America by value. Uh, it's a huge, huge issue. Uh, and if we don't have a functioning export import bank, it does put uh, future um, uh, sales at risk. Because you know, critics have said that the export import bank is corporate welfare sure. for Boeing and a handful right. of other companies. Right. But as you pointed out, most of its customers are small businesses. Right. And I know we have several here in Clark County that are small businesses people have probably never heard of. Right. Unless they're connected with that business, but they use the export import. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Well, what about the, uh, the competitive nature of the airline industry? How, uh, how concerned are you about your competitors that also obviously are out there looking to make sales in the market? Um, we are in some of the most competitive times we've ever been in. Uh, you know, uh, for the last number of years, right, it's been Boeing versus Airbus. Uh, as uh, Airbus has come up through launch aid and other things uh, and taken share, and a lot of other Air, U.S. air makers, are, of course, not, are not here anymore. Airplane makers are not here anymore. Um, if you look at emerging competitors, Bombardier in Canada is, is um, made, the C, made the C series. Uh, uh, Russia has a plane. Uh, Brazil has a plane. China has a plane. You know, all of these uh, plane makers are government supported, just as Airbus has been government supported. Uh, it is the the push for the new folks to come into this market uh, and Airbus to be as aggressive as they've always been in the market is creating a tremendously competitive uh, scenario right now. And if you add in that the airlines, uh, as I uh, mentioned earlier, is the, the, the airlines are uh, in a very competitive posture. Uh, what we're seeing is globally there's an effort for all the uh, original equipment manufacturers to get as efficient and cost-effective as possible. So in 2013, Airbus had 78,800 people working in its commercial airplane unit. At the end of 2015, it had 72,800 people working in its commercial airplane unit. 
If you go back to 2012, of course, we peaked at, you know, in the state of Washington, 83 or 4 or 5 or 6,000 employees, but that was when the 787 was brand new in the factory and our, the 47-8 was brand new in the factory. And starting in 2012, we've, we've, we've gotten more efficient uh, and we've come down. And in recent months, in 2016, we've gone from about 80,000 people to about 75,000 people uh, in the state. Now, we in 2016 have done that through early retirements, largely, and through not backfilling attrition because the entire industry, if you look globally, uh, is in an effort to get as, co as competitive as you can and as efficient as you can to compete with the new subsidized uh, uh, airplane makers that are coming online, but also to provide our customers with uh, the more for less that they need that we as consumers are demanding of them. So it's, um, you know, I have been at Boeing six years, uh, but if you hear, if you uh, talk to folks who've been here, uh, you know, for a long, long time, they say it's the most competitive uh, market they have, uh, some of them have ever seen. Uh, and it's driven by uh, these subsidized competitors coming in and wanting, and wanting to compete. Uh, and and take share. The good news is we're we're doing we're, we're holding our own, but uh, the challenge is uh, the cost competition is really intense uh, right now uh, all around the world. Right, which sort of gets back to an earlier question I made about labor costs, mm -hmm. which are a big deal mm -hmm. when you've when you've got eighty thousand uh, employees and how much of a factor those labor costs are, you know relative to the skilled workforce that we were talking about. Yeah. But I guess you feel like you've, you're have sort of hitting that balance. You know, um, I'm, I'm probably not the labor cost guy, okay? Uh, I will tell you that um, the company, as you all know, uh, was required to disclose the value of the tax incentives to it. Uh, we did that back in April or May, and we said, look, it was it was – the stated value of the tax incentives to Boeing was $300 million in, in 2015. Now, Boeing's investment in the state of Washington in 2015 was $13 billion. Six and a half or so uh, in wages, uh, six and a half or so in supplier uh, uh, spend, hundreds of millions of dollars in state and local taxes paid in the state of Washington. And then some interesting things like $52 million in charitable contributions that between the company and retirees and employees we made in 2015, uh, which is a pretty steady number over the years. We've been good for about $50 million a year, give or take, uh, in uh, community investments. And then something that a lot of people don't know about, uh, you know, Boeing paid $32, more than $32 million in tuition uh, in to state of Washington colleges and universities in 2015 because we have a program called we call it learning together if you're a Boeing employee you want to go get your four-year degree you want to go back to school and get a graduate degree or you just want to improve your skills the company pays your tuition uh, we're far and away the largest uh, tuition payer in the state of what we're farther away the largest taxpayer in the state of Washington too um, but we're far and away the largest tuition payer because we've had a program for a long time that invests uh, in our folks what I am most concerned about uh, is that we understand that the stated value of the tax incentives of $300 million, one, is largely uh, derived by how much you invest in the state, uh, and two, uh, is a key factor in making sure the entire industry is healthy uh, and growing in the state, and that's where I go, I go back to what I said earlier. First, do no harm to the competitiveness of the state uh, in the coming in the coming years. This is my uh, quirky question of the of the half hour, but okay. Um, and it's, this might just be business as usual, but what the heck happened to the seven forty seven? Um, the large airplane market is not the biggest segment uh, of our market. Um, now, you know, we think there's a history, or sorry, we think there's a future for the 747. Oh. Um, you know, we've, um, we've announced some sa 747 sales this year. Um, Where were those? Uh, I have to get you that. Okay. We have it. I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, Donald Trump didn't buy one of them. <laughs> Donald Trump did not buy, uh, okay, yeah. to my knowledge, right, yes. Okay. Um, a 747. Yeah. Um, 
The 747 is a uniquely capable cargo airplane uh, because, you know, our cargo version, the nose lifts up. There's really great turnaround time for how you load cargo and unload cargo. Um, the cargo market is, is struggling. Uh, so, you know, you've seen us come down in rate on the 747. Uh, we think we're at the right rate that we can keep going, uh, you know, for the foreseeable future on the 747, and we think the 747 has a great future ahead of it. Um, we're going to be building uh, 747s for Air Force One. We've got some passenger uh, 747s still uh, in the pipeline, and, and we've got some cargo ones. But um, it's a symptom. Uh, I mean, what's going on in the 747 is is symptom of there is... Uh, a lot of uncertainty in the global economy right now uh, and capital and folks uh, we don't know what's going on with capital investment you know there's a lot of things that have added to uncertainty brexit certainly uh, anytime there's a u.s election there's uncertainty uh, there's questions about some of the uh, economies in asia and that makes people hold on to uh, their money and not necessarily make big capital investments so uh, you know we have to see what the next couple of years bring see i remember those new old commercials when it first came out, and you go upstairs, and there's this big bar. It's iconic, sure. Yeah. So, sure. so those those planes still exist with that big bar upstairs, and well, uh, you know, the customers uh, are always trying to figure out how they can maximize revenue, and so a lot of the upstairs is now uh, premium seating. Yeah. Uh, you know, everyone does something a little bit different with that, yeah. and I can't say it doesn't exist, but it might exist in some places, um, uh, but. Um, a uh, lot of seating is seating, you know, yeah. uh, seats are really valuable. Right. Yes, uh, somebody in the newsroom asked me to ask you, why are you building those seats so doggone tight? Now, my answer to that was, hey, somebody orders it and we build the, it. The, you know, the, you know, <laughs> people don't know this, um, but we actually don't build the seats. We install the seats. The customers specify the seats and they go out and contract with people to, to build the seats. Uh, and then, of course, we install them. Um, Seats are really valuable, and the more seats you can put on an airplane, the more money you can make with that yeah. airplane. Yeah. Or it, and again, and we all vote with our pocketbooks, right? Yeah. So uh, it's. Are, are customers ordering wider seats as people get larger? <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Question. I don't know the answer to that question. I'm sorry. But, and, um, I want to follow up. You mentioned uh, starting in, in 2012, you've gotten more efficient. Uh, and does that mean are more jobs becoming automated and eventually are we all going to be put out of work by machines? Uh, we do have more automation in the factory. That is not driving. Um, we do not think our automation is going to be a big, uh, you know, sort of replace replacement of people. We think uh, that automation is going to do a couple things for us. It's going to improve productivity so we can do more with the people we have. It's going to improve quality, uh, you know, uh, as we be more precision uh, and that kind of thing. And it's going to dramatically improve safety of the folks in the factory. So um, I think the short answer is no, not really. Uh, to your question, we think it enables a lot of productivity. It improves quality and improves safety, but it has not been a big driver in um, uh, you know, uh, com coming down in numbers. If I could just jump on yeah. that real quick too. Um, there's also um, a growth in um, the, as I mentioned earlier, the automation piece. There's a company in Everett um, that is, they, they just hired, I think, 100 engineers um, uh, this past year um, just to create the automated tooling that, that Bill's talking about. And then the Megatronics that I mentioned earlier is an outgrowth of all of that. So there's increased growth in those areas, too. And now you mentioned there are, what, I think 1,400 aerospace companies in the state. That how many of those are reliant upon Boeing? If Boeing went away, left the state, yeah. how many of those companies would survive? No, I, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I can tell you that, you know, a significant number the, of them are Boeing suppliers, and there is a huge concern, depending on what happens with these tax incentives, about, you know, what that means for the industry. A big draw for companies to even come here is, is Boeing. And so we need to make sure that Boeing's strong so that the rest of the industry's strong. We equate that to a strong economy overall. Sure. Do you know how many people those companies employ in total? 
Um, do, what were the new numbers? I think there, so we'll get you the exact answer, yeah. okay? okay? Because there's a report yeah. that just came yeah. out. Uh, the number that strikes in my head is that the that aerospace and, re, and related industries, um, and that's the, the, the notion related is just sort of an artifact of how you define things. So a related industry would be a machine shop, which is absolutely right. an aerospace company. I think those, uh, those numbers together were about 115 or 120,000. Um, people and I could be off, so we'll get you the report. Right. Okay. Uh, and then, and then, uh, if you then say, what are the indirect jobs uh, associated with that? It's about a quarter million jobs in the state that yeah, are council, that are Seven Elevens that have to be constructed. Disemployed. That would be those would be the induced jobs. That's yes. yeah, that's exactly right. So it's about a quarter million jobs in the state are are somehow reliant mm -hmm. on aerospace activity. Mm -hmm. But we'll get you uh, the full report, okay. so you have the specific sure. numbers. Well, anything else we should ask? Um, I, I will say, you know, I think that we will probably, over the coming months, have a discussion about um, the industry and, and, and jobs. And, you know, as I mentioned, um, in, recent, in the recent year or two, while we have a really uh, robust outlook for the next 20 years, there's a lot of uncertainty right now in, in the next year or two. Uh, and that's causing everybody around the world, from airlines to airplane manufacturers to engine manufacturers, to uh, really try to understand what their right uh, cost structure is across the board, right? From inventory to um, uh, processes and, and production, but also to people. Uh, and like Airbus and like other manufacturers, we've come down this year. We've tried to do it in a way uh, that just doesn't backfill people as they retire and, and does uh, give people the opportunity to do some early retirement. Um, and so what I don't want us to think, things are going to get crazy in January and February, and we're going to hear all kinds of stuff as we go into legislative sessions. What I don't want people to think is that there have been big job moves out of the state uh, in 2016. The industry is in a really interesting time right now. Uh, one of the things that we've been worried about uh, as uh, we've talked about this notion of the incentives and whether the state's going to go back on, the, on, on its word and whether we're going to have a jobs number tied to it, is we live in an inherently cyclical industry. And our employment goes up and our employment goes down. Uh, and when half of your company is located in one state, putting a really high ratchet on your employment really ties the hands of uh, the leaders of the company to manage their business and respond to the market. And um, I am really worried that we are going to focus too much in the coming months on, uh, on, uh, on, on numbers and, and what we're going to lose is this idea that there's a great workforce opportunity here with retirements coming through uh, and what we really need is students getting into the core plus curricula uh, and, and classes that we devise, f kids going into STEM fields in college to take the jobs that we know are going to be coming open in the next four, five, six, seven years. That's where I, 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 what we really hope we focus on the future as a state and, and not uh, set up a construct that... Um, penalizes uh, any aerospace company, ours or any company here, for responding to the cyclicality of the market. That's our, that's our big concern uh, going into 2017. Well, you had a breakfast here yesterday? <coughs> no, this morning. This morning, and yeah. who was that with? It's just some, uh, we, we're over at the chamber, uh, and it's with, so I, you know, it's okay. a bunch of, they just did, had a membership meeting. Did um, you hear any concerns there or anything that we haven't covered here that uh, uh, you could let us know about? No, I think we had a, I think it was a lot, a lot of the same okay. stuff. Just, um, just for the, from the standpoint of uh, what's local for Boeing here, um, do you have employees here in Clark County? Yeah, we've got about 250, give or take, uh, employees here in Clark County. Okay. Where, um, where are they? I'm sorry? Where are they? And what do they do? Uh, that I don't know. I'm, I'm going to guess... Uh, in sort of descending order, they work either, uh, probably uh, at our Gresham facility okay. or they work at our subsidiary uh, in situ, which is our unmanned um, 
subsidiary that's out in the gorge, but also has an office here in okay. Vancouver. Yeah. And I and I would bet a handful probably drive north to Fredrickson uh, or the southern end of our you know sort of complex so those up are, there. Are the places that commute to a Boeing job in Portland. Some of the, some of them, yeah. Some of yeah. that's my Maybe guess, although I don't know. But I'm, you know, I, I my guess is it's mostly in situ and mostly the Portland facility that are okay. here. We've also got just under 300 retirees uh, here oh. in the Vancouver area. Um, I forget the number of suppliers, about 20, I think. Uh, I'll get you the number. We'll get you the exact number uh, here uh, in the area. The new uh, community attributes report that came out had said 93 suppliers in Clark County. Okay. And uh, that equates to about, a, um, I think it was 1,200 jobs, okay. aerospace jobs, in the county. Okay. Good. Right. Well, thank you both for joining us. Thank you all thank for you. your time. Yeah, you bet. Appreciate it. Great.